Hello there YouTube, Devin here again. Uh, today just a nice kind of quick short little video for you here to show you some kind of visual comparisons of Canadian uh, army helmets as far as like the composite ones would go, uh, shape and size and whatnot. And um, I have a very very rare one here to kind of show you and we'll compare it to the current issued CG634 so you'll you'll get to see what that actually looks like on a person. I'll put it on here today. So. Um, but some little history behind the uh, the evolution of Canadian composite helmets, and I have a whole uh, video on that, the history of com Canadian composite helmets and stuff like that, and how um, in the late 80s, uh, well, kind of mid to late 80s is when the testing started, uh, Canada's looking to get rid of their M1 helmets, very venerable in service, the M1 helmet, and... Uh, Overall, a very, very good. You might notice the seam is off on this one. This helmet has its own video, and that's because it's a triple bail M1 helmet um, for paratroopers. So this was a Canadian test design helmet. They made a few thousand of these shells, and a lot of them just got boxed up after they decided it wasn't really worth it. They would just keep using surplus American paratrooper liners. So, um, so it wasn't really worth it, so they boxed them all up, and eventually they made it onto the surplus market, and I found one, because everyone's always like, that's an Israeli helmet, but the Israeli helmets are marked on the rim, and this one isn't, even faintly, and I did some reading uh, based off of where it came from and how the shell shape is ever so slightly different. They're slightly smaller than the Israeli ones, um, because uh, there's actually two, um, three different versions of M1 shells, um, so in World War II, you have what's called the big M1 shell, and there's two versions of that M1 shell. There's the front seam and the rear seam, and the fixed bale and the swivel bale, and all that can be interchanged and whatnot based on if the helmet went back for repairs or retrofitting or yada yada, and who made it and whatnot. But as far as the general size and shape goes, there is the large M1 helmet shell, and then there's a slightly smaller dimension M1 helmet shell, and the smaller ones kind of come out um, towards the end of Korea, and then Vietnam, they did a limited run of them, and they are of the smaller style. So this is of the smaller style, whereas the Israeli ones uh, tended to be made on the older style of M1 helmet shells, so the, the bigger uh, M1 helmet shells uh, machines. So, um, so everything I can say point to that's one of those Canadian test ones. And the only way you could pick one out from an Israeli one is knowing that. And I, they're one of the things that it's so rare and it's like, how much is it actually worth, you know, because you can't really put a price on it. And I'm sure the other ones are out there just around. Um, if I was able to get one just by random chance, I'm sure there's other ones out there that are just around that nobody knows what they have. So, because they were never billed as something special or collectible or anything like that. So, um, so in the late, uh, mid to late uh, 80s, uh, the Canadian Army is like, okay, got to modernize. We got to get in. Uh, to, you know, start start moving away from our steel helmets, you know, start developing uh, some camouflage, some other stuff, move, move into the modern era. They start testing a lot of new weapon systems and other stuff here, which ultimately would uh, lead to the adoption of the C7 uh, away from the C1A1, which is the FAL, and for those of you who don't know, the C7 is an M16. So, um, so they eventually, you know, they test a whole bunch of helmets, they test the Orlite, out of Israel, they test the British Mark VI, they test the American Pazgat, and uh, ultimately they really like uh, a lot of features between the Orlite and the Pazgat. They really weren't super keen on the Mark VI, which is, you know, understandable. It was kind of an okay design, even right at its adoption. Um, it was only okay until better materials really came along. The ballistic nylon was a little weird. Um, but they did test helmets, uh, Pazgat's made in ballistic nylon. They tested Orlites made out of ballistic nylon. Um, they tested an Orlite made out of fiberglass. They tested an Orlite made out of Kevlar. Uh, and they tested a Pazgat made out of Kevlar. And then, ultimately, they decided that, like, the Pazgat was going to be kind of the way to go, ultimately. And then uh, a local uh, company, a uh, company by the name of Barday, uh, B A. R-R-D-A-Y, uh, was a local manufacturer, and that whole national pride thing that a lot of militaries seem to have took over, and they were like, we can make you a helmet based off of the PASGAT to your exact specifications, which you would want. And uh, I have the very early version of the Bardet, uh, the one with, with what's called the hockey pad liner in it, 
just like a series of foam pillows in one kind of big continuous liner. And then uh, later they would go to a more Pazgat style suspension system. So i uh, show you too how well that was liked. But uh, I actually have a very, very uh, rare testing one. So um, this, is a, this is the tag that I got with the helmet uh, as a reason why it was rejected. It is a Bardet uh, Pattern 1 Medium Paratrooper variant. Um, it was rejected for chips in the paint from the factory. So as to why it wasn't adopted. So this went to an inspector and the inspector was like, the, the paint on this was in mixed right or something like that. There was too much hardener or not enough hardener or something. And uh, it was uh, uh, therefore given this tag that says it's not approved for service and it is serial number 002, um, which makes this a fairly incredibly rare uh, collector's piece. So, um, and uh, here is that helmet right here. You can see the paint chips on it. Uh, most of the paint is okay. You can kind of tell where a lot of the, uh, the paint had issues. Um, and you could still see some cracks kind of right along where the seams of the helmets are, where the bends are in the Kevlar. Uh, this helmet is made out of Kevlar. You could see the, the weave of it right there. It's in kind of the same style of paint as the Pazgat. It's a little bit ever so not as gray as the Pazgat, though. It's a little bit greener. So just in case this light doesn't do you justice, depending on your monitor and stuff like that. Um, it's ever so slightly greener, whereas the Pazgat kind of olive drab color tended to be a little, a little more gray. This is a little bit greener, um, ever so slightly. Uh, so uh, we'll show you the liner here. Uh, the liner on this is the, like I said, the hockey pad style of liner. Um, they call it that because this is at the time what a lot of hockey helmets use as pads. And it's just a series of, as you can see, like articulated foam pads, and they're held in place with screws. Um, the same kind of screws you find on a Pazgat, so the, like the A washers and the bolts. Um, so this has uh, six screws all the way around it. You have one down here, one in the temple region, one on the front, same on the other two sides, and one in the back there. Uh, this helmet also has a very high swoop uh, to use with body armor of the time, which was fairly high collar, so your helmet wouldn't rock forward when you were in prone. Uh, it would not rock forward and block your vision. And uh, it has the very complicated uh, suspension system, as you can see here, which is just a mess of straps and, and uh, D-rings and loops and screws and um, M-buckles and just tons of other stuff. So um, this eventually was made and it served until the uh, adoption of the uh, CG-634. Both versions did. Um, and eventually they realized they were kind of too complicated to make and... Um, they weren't really being made to the highest quality that they could have been, um, so they eventually decided to open helmet trials again in the mid-90s, which resulted in the, the CG-634 being made. So so we'll put this on here for you to, to let you kind of see how how the helmet would work and fit. It's uh, got two, let's get a little closer here, it's got two little tabs. There's one tab here that's just a snap uh, to make a tab. Uh, this is actually a really neat feature I didn't notice at first when I got this. Um, so this is the snap that you would use for the chin cup. Normally, it's up up here. So right there is that normal snap. Now, let's say you need to go put on a gas mask or some winter gear or equipment or something. You can undo this snap. Kind of one of those weird like Pazgat directional snaps and this one was like a test helmet so it's not quite like perfect but you can undo this snap here i'm just not going to try to fight it because i don't want to break it this piece of history but you can undo the snap and you get the extra two inches to have it fit over a gas mask or something relatively easily without needing like the american Pazgat did in the ach's those little extender buckles this is just built in so it's the pull tab by itself and then if you need it you could undo this snap Come on now. Whatever, it's not gonna go right here. So, at least in this position. So you could take this and unsnap this and it would snap onto that stud there and you could have the extended chin strap then to put on your your gas mask and stuff. So here's how the, the helmet would have looked being worn. So. And uh, we'll just kind of turn to the side here so you can see the profile. Okay, so there you go. 
this is probably a bad time to wear a hoodie. So if I want to show you the back now, turn to the, turn to the rear here. Um, I don't know if you could hear me or not, but you could see I could fully look up and the helmet doesn't ever, ever touch my back, which means that this helmet is very good for going prone which is, means it was actually kind of way ahead of its design. It's not the most comfortable, the foam. I don't know if the foam was softer when it was newer, but the foam is actually quite hard right now, and it tends to, those little pillows put kind of pressure points around your head. It is in my size. This is a size medium, um, which is what uh, the Canadian helmet sizing is a little bit different than the U.S. helmet sizing, um, where they basically had small, medium, and large, and the vast majority of soldiers would fit into a medium. So, all right, so we'll now uh, take that off and we will compare that to how a CG634 vet, uh, fits. This is a Gen 1 CG634, has the uh, very old kind of blurred edge um, CAD pad, the Gen 1 CAD pad cover on it. Um, this is the one, as you can see here, it's Gen 1 because it has the black rubber rim. Gen 2s will have a green rim that is kind of that plastic like uh, an ACH would have. So. And these are made out of Spectra, which is a little uh, weird. It's basically Kevlar. It's just Kevlar by another name for the most part. So it doesn't really perform any ballistically better. Um, it does have a slightly longer shelf life, supposedly on paper. I don't have any grasp on whether that is true or not though. So that's just from all the reading I've done. So here we go. See the CG634 and it's kind of also again, needlessly complex suspension system okay i'll do this do do this whole thing again so you can see the the prone capabilities of this helmet once i turn here so you can see there it is from the front view all right from the side view and from the rear and then if i look up this helmet also doesn't have a lot of bite, but it does have just a bit right where the kind of yoke for the rear of the suspension system here, that does kind of bite. But this helmet also kind of sits very high in the back, which is another carryover from the Bardet. So it's to help prevent your helmet from biting uh, when you're prone. So this helmet does have the uh, problem of also kind of making you chipmunk and restricting your jaw movement because of these little adjusters here, which are prone to sliding. Uh, and adjusting on the fly, which was a huge issue uh, with the Canadian helmets. And a lot of them were modified in the field by soldiers, so they wouldn't do that because otherwise your helmet could just loosen while you're running or doing anything really. And then it could adjust to be in front of your eyes where you can't see and a ton of other stuff like that. And also wearing this helmet for, for uh, a lot of hours, uh, soldiers complained about this band right here that held the sweatband in place because it would oftentimes after wearing it for so long would leave a mark that would almost be permanent on your forehead. It could stay for, for hours and sometimes up to a day after you took your helmet off because of how it was kind of a poor design like that. It is based off of the French uh, like F1 and later F2 suspension system. So you see that uh, involved too. That was also one of the helmets that was trialed. So which is why they uh, the early um, CG-634s were also made out of Spectra, same as the French F2 helmets, so. But hopefully, uh, it's kind of short little brief history video um, of that and getting to see a comparison of the uh, CG-634 next to the, the short-lived kind of Bardet helmet. You could see their kind of influencers and how this one influenced this one and everything else like that. And hopefully it's a cool video and you guys like this and you get to see a kind of short little thing that might not be very well represented on the internet. So thank you so much for watching and hopefully I'll see you all in the next video.